Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday the 28th of March. I'm John Connolly, the Spectator's news editor and your host this week. Coming up on the show. What happened to forgiveness? It's Easter weekend coming up and I'll be speaking to Peter Hitchens and Tim Stanley about why forgiveness seems so rare today. Donald Trump paid a 175 million appeal bond this week, reduced from nearly half a billion at the last minute. Freddie Gray joins me on the show. Lionel Shriver writes in this week's magazine about a startling new revelation from the New York Times. Apparently going electric requires electricity. She'll be on to tell us all about it. Ukraine currently has a birth rate crisis. Svetlana Moronets joins me to discuss the way the country is dealing with the problem. And finally, Damien Thompson will tell us about his friend Stephen O'Leary. Before we get going, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. First up, what happened to forgiveness? Douglas Murray has written a cover piece for this week's Easter special on the subject. To discuss it, I'm joined by journalists Peter Hitchens and Tim Stanley. Peter and Tim, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. It's um, a joy so far. <laughs> it's a pleasure. <laughs> a pleasure to have you. Um, you're here to discuss the, the cover of our magazine this week, which is all about forgiveness and perhaps the lack of it in the modern world. So maybe it's not as off, Peter. I mean, do you think there is a, a lack of forgiveness in sort of modern society at the moment? Well, there is a lack of forgiveness, but there's also a lack of people desiring to be forgiven. And or understanding that you need to be. There's a lack of people repenting, a lack of people saying what I did was wrong. Uh, and there's a counterfeit forgiveness which is spread as a result, which is people basically saying, oh, I don't care, I don't mind, that's all right, you can go, uh, which isn't forgiveness and doesn't bear any proper relation to it. And it stops people from thinking about how deep the issue actually is. Oh, what do you think about that, Tim? Do you think, you know, we're not, maybe not... People need to be more, <laughs> more contrite. Mm. Well, I, I think as Douglas says in his piece, uh, because of social media, it's as if you've got an insight in people's brain. You can see what they're thinking as they think it. Uh, and this creates the potential for more offence than there ever was before. Uh, and there's also a sort of a reluctance uh, to forgive, to let go, as Peter says, to ask for forgiveness and to acknowledge what you've got wrong. I, I suppose if I, uh, I suppose someone might raise the objection, were we always very forgiving? We are a society that, for instance, no longer practices the death penalty. Death penalty, not very forgiving sort of thing to do. Although I personally we think... We don't openly practice the death penalty, but we do actually practice it. The police shoot people. I right. An awful lot of people commit suicide in prison. Uh, to, to such an extent, you can expect it to happen. And we still go We to have war. an unofficial death penalty, but nobody will take responsibility for it. And I also think... In some ways, worse. I, I think one can actually forgive someone and still judiciously, judicially take their life, because I think the two things could be separate. Well, it's a very good part of moral the point, concerns. isn't it? That, because what if you... I might forgive uh, you, you uh, for killing somebody... I know, but that doesn't help. Uh, the person you've killed is in no position to forgive you, and the state is not in any position to forgive you on his or her behalf. Yes. And we're always forgiving, saying, well, I, it's perfectly right, you killed X, I, I forgive you, I can see you're contrite. But so what? Uh, you, can't actually, you can't actually fully forgive them because the person they most thoroughly offended is, is dead and unavailable to forgive you, so you can't do it. This is one of the reasons for having a death penalty at all. Mm -hmm. I feel like we probably could get a bit sidetracked on the death right. penalty. Oh, I love these. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is, this is where moral, this is where uh, proper moral discussion, which we rarely have anymore, because mm -hmm. society doesn't discuss virtue. Society doesn't, society discusses politics all the time. It doesn't discuss moral issues and personal moral concerns mm -hmm. at all. And therefore we don't have those concerns. And, and, and when you start to open it up, it can take in lots of different directions. I mean, if there were a, a lefty on this group, we've got two sort of quite right-wing people talking about a third right-wing right. -wing right. <laughs> are you right-wing, right Jim? I never knew. I always describe my politics as unpleasantly right-wing. But it, it, we've got two right-wing. If, if you had a lefty here, they would say, come on, you right-wingers. You're mm -hmm. not the most forgiving people. You're always saying, let's go to war. You're always saying uh, criminals should be uh, slaughtered in prison and not let out again. Mm. So they would say that there, there's a sort of a subjectivity here. But what I would reply to that with is there is, and I hope we'll get onto this, there is the personal morality of I'm obliged by my faith to forgive if someone seeks forgiveness. Mm. But then there is the concern of the state and society, which is bigger and has lots of other moral things it has to consider. Mm. So if someone murdered a member of my family, I hope I'd have the courage as a Christian to forgive them if they ask for it. Um, but the state's job is not to forgive that person because the state's job is to maintain law and order. Mm. So, you, so you see, whenever you get into these moral questions, you, you sort of realize that there isn't just one two-dimensional 
answer to every moral question. Usually there's a whole set of different responsibilities. And part of the problem with our society is we too do look at things in a very 2D way. So, mm. so some people just say, why don't we just forgive everyone? There, there, there is a left-wing view nowadays which is very ultra-forgiving that just says, let everyone out of prison. Don't judge anyone for the terrible things they've done because of things like racism might inform their, uh, what they've done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, no, there has to be, there, there is a, a community moral uh, position and there is the individual's moral position. Right. I mean, a point of Douglas's piece is that perhaps forgiveness now is drawn along political lines. So you're more likely to forgive those in your tribe, but then if anyone on the other side of the aisle does something that goes beyond acceptability or so on, we're kind of less forgiving. And do you, do you think that's the case? I take issue with a very large part of what Douglas says. All this stuff about dredging stuff out of people's pasts. Um, yes, okay, it's often very embarrassing and it is a political weapon. But the truth is that if you don't acknowledge that you've done certain things in your life which were bad, then you will never seek forgiveness for them and you will never get it. And I think we should be aware of our pasts, uh, even if we don't necessarily want everybody on Twitter to be aware of our pasts. And it's important. I'm not sure I entirely agree with Douglas's direction there. We do bad things. My whole life behind me is a litter of terrible things, most of which I hope nobody will ever find out. But it, 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 my vision of hell is being slowly turned on a, on a barbecue spit while a, a video of my my most embarrassing and stupid episodes is played to everybody who ever knew me in life. That's that's what we really fear, is people finding out how horrible we, we really are. So uh, that's not quite the point. His very good point is the one that he gets out of Hannah Arendt, which is that the consequences of our actions are unchangeable, uh, that they are sometimes things which we couldn't have predicted, though I tend to think that we should try a lot harder to work out what the consequences should be, and that once they're done, they're done, they're irrevocable. Mm. I think his perspective uh, sees forgiveness uh, from a utilitarian point of view, mm. uh, that we need it. And he's right about that. We need it because otherwise uh, we, can't, we can't get along as a society. And we also need to progress as a society. So when you have conflicts, for instance, at some point, someone like in Northern Ireland has to say sorry mm. and someone has to say, I forgive you, if only for the future generation to be able to operate, to be able to separate itself from the crimes of the past and, and move on. Uh, so I think he's right about that. But... Uh, where I always slightly disagree with Douglas is I feel he invokes Christian morality mm. without quite getting into the theology of it. And in the piece, he has a, an interesting turn of phrase where he talks about the revolutionary element of Christianity, mm. uh, which is saying you must love your enemies. He doesn't quite follow that through to its, uh, to its full theological conclusions. So what do we mean by this? Well, um, from a Christian perspective, the problem with life is we're separated from God. And the point of life is to try to rebuild that relationship with him. And we do that through the acts of saying sorry and being forgiven. That's one way of doing it. Uh, Christianity is a giant forgiveness machine. People think it's obsessed with guilt. It's the other way around. It, it's, a, it's a way of making you confront what's wrong in order that you can be forgiven and then released from that sin and to move on. Uh, and there's a, there's a bit in Luke uh, in which um, Christ is asked, how often must you forgive someone? And he says, if your brother, uh, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Um, but if he asks for forgiveness, forgive him. How often? Well, if he sins against you seven times in a day, forgive him seven times a day. Now, in the normal realm of human re relations, if you just draw back into the Douglas utilitarian point of view, if someone, if someone stole from you seven times mm. and asked for forgiveness seven times, you would you would ordinarily think they were just a crook who should be written off, but also the person who forgives them is an idiot uh, for constantly forgiving them. But that's the nature of Christian morality. It's, it's, it's giving. It, it, it's self-giving because the model is God. God forgives all the time. And, and I, I sometimes think when we have these debates about what is the usefulness of forgiveness, let's move beyond that. What does God want? God gives us the model. We must forgive in the way he would forgive. But I mean, Tim, that raises an interesting point, doesn't it? In the sense that as a society, we're becoming more secular. The practice, of Christianity, <laughs> the practice of Christianity is lowering. The number of practicing Christians is on the low. Well, we, I mean, does that mean... become secular. The, the Christianity is, is vestigial in, in our society and in our national debate and in our discussions. People talk about morals when they mean ethics. Uh, they have no foundation for the, for the ethics which they adopt. The jolly old golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you, it actually means appear to do unto others as you would have, to have them do to you, which has always been its greatest fault. And that's as high as we get. So it, the, 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 one of the things I think Christians ought to do if they want any kind of revival of their faith is to stop being so soppy. And the passage which Tim just mentioned, the, Luke 17, 3 to 4, is the only passage, I think, in the New Testament in which our Lord s speaks of uh, repenting. 
uh, but in fact it overrides all the others where he doesn't. I, my own view is that in, in, in the first century Holy Land, anybody who was confronted with the suggestion that you should forgive somebody who wasn't sorry would just have laughed in your face. The idea was so ludicrous, it didn't need to be mentioned that you should, uh, that you should repent. But you do have to repent, and repent just doesn't just mean say sorry, it means be sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is one of the reasons why, uh, why Christian societies have been quite ready to have uh, secular punishment. Uh, done in the name of the Christian faith. All the, the, the Victorian courthouses of this country bear Christian symbols, in the case of the Old Bailey, quite chunky quotations from the Bible. They thought they were exercising Christian morality by punishing the wrongdoer and defending the children of the poor, as it says in the Old Bailey. So I think that we, we have to stop people getting the impression, and I have to say I'm afraid some Christian priests and pastors give this impression, uh, that by forgiving we mean letting off, because I certainly don't. Uh, I don't expect to be forgiven for no. things I'm not sorry for, and I would not expect uh, to, to forgive somebody for something he or she was not sorry for. No, but it's, it's, and it's also, it's not, it wouldn't be Christian to allow someone to think that they can get away without, with saying sorry without meaning it. It wouldn't be Christian to allow someone to think they can go on practicing an immoral, uh, do, doing something which is immoral, which is damning them without correction. Yeah. And the passage that I quoted does begin with, if your brother sins against you, you should rebuke him. Yeah. And that is the bit which is so often lacking from some Christian ministry nowadays. You have to call things out which are bad. Uh, there's a lovely line from, I think it's Sue C.S. Lewis, who says, um, all the people are in hell are in hell because they wouldn't say sorry. Mm. The point being that the root uh, of damnation is pride. And I think from a personal point of view, that is so true. I have known in my own family, uh, I, I've, I, I, can, I wouldn't say who it is, but I, I know of one uh, mother who raised her child appallingly. It was very bad to her her whole life. And towards the end of her life, she fell ill and her child cared for her and nursed her. She died without once saying sorry. What was the cost? What was the need for that? There was no need for that. She could have done. But this is what human beings do. You wouldn't, because you say, when you say everyone in hell is people who say sorry, people will hear that and they very lazily think, oh, so Christianity means if I just say sorry, I'll be fine, I'll be out of hell. That's not how it works at all. If, if nothing else, you've got to say sorry and mean it. But also, it's amazing how reluctant people are to say sorry. Mm. It's incredible how reluctant people are to seek forgiveness in their daily lives. It's a very difficult thing to ask of. And that no doubt applies to you as it does to me. We are of course. reluctant to say sorry, and uh, I, I can think of several things that I probably ought to be sorry for, but I just am not. <laughs> yeah. And it will take an awful lot to persuade me to, to to be sorry. But the other purpose of forgiveness, of course, is to make is to make life tolerable. If you believe that the ghastly things that you've done are held against you without uh, without, without any possibility of release, then what is the purpose? And then and then trying to live a good and uh, and, and and wise life, you you might as well. Uh, just carry on plunging down towards the bottom of the pit. That's one of the reasons why the, the whole Christian concept of divine grace and forgiveness is so important, because it offers people who have done bad things some sort of hope. A lot of people from outside find that quite hard to take, because it's, uh, it, that obviously offers some sort of relief even to the worst people in the world. I mean, both of you seem fairly set on this idea that you know it's kind of wrong to forgive someone who is not contrite, who does not apologize. Do you think there's any sort of benefit to a person who does forgive in that case as a way of sort of saying, well, you know, to take your example there of someone who's been a poor mother, that I'm not going to hold on to this sort of animosity I have for you. I am going to forgive you. Even if you can never apologize, I am going to forgive you. Do you of, think there's any value to that? Of course they can. Of course there is value to it. And I would encourage them to do it. It's just my reading of the scriptures is that you don't have to forgive if it's not asked of you. Because you can't expect human beings to do something God can't do. And oh, sorry, that, that, this is where we start to get into traps. God can't do or God we, we assume might not do because mm. we are taught that God forgives when you say sorry. Uh, so if you then reflect that upon human relations, if someone does something terrible, makes no attempt to say sorry, and in fact goes on doing it, the idea that there is a, a human obligation, it's too much to ask of human beings. And one of the graceful things about the scriptures is they almost never ask, I don't think they really do ask something which is unimaginable of a human being. Peter, I want to bring you back to something. Um, you know, you mentioned the fact that a lot of people aren't showing enough contrition these days or perhaps don't deserve to be forgiven. It seems a bit of, um, there's almost a trope these days that when someone does something wrong on social media, for example, and there's a big sort of firestorm around it, they're facing a problem from every corner, the worst thing they can do is to apologize because it almost makes people pile on more and sense weakness and smell blood in the water. Do you think that's a problem? And do you think that's going to make people less likely to 
admit wrong in future well, and therefore the be forgiven. It's part of the nature of our new morality, isn't it? It doesn't actually contain a, a, a route for forgiveness at all. Uh, forgiveness is an admission of weakness. You, you, you just mustn't do it. And it's one of the reasons why we're, we're, we're creating you know, such a very unsatisfactory society. Uh, it, it is uh, it is folly, though I have to say uh, that there have there been occasions. I mean, for instance, I, I try to, 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 to make an absolute rule where I make a stupid mistake in public uh, or, or where I, I, I wrong somebody. I very quickly try to put it right. And it's not totally impossible uh, for this to work. Even on social media, sometimes people will realize what's going on. If anybody ever apologizes to me, I am very rapid to congratulate them mm. uh, for their courage. <laughs> no, for their courage to do so, because I know that it costs a lot to apologize in public. Mm. So I, I, it, it, generally, there's a lot of, there, there is a lot of, uh, of, of callousness and total misunderstanding of what, of what good is and what, and what good isn't. But then the whole, the whole morality of, of what used to be um, inaccurately called political correctness, but I've never come up with a better term, the whole morality of it is, uh, is very, very hard to escape and if you it, it's basically it's telling you that you are the wrong kind of person and it doesn't it doesn't offer any forgiveness it just it just tells you go and live quietly in the margins of life and shut up and we won't bother you again mm. but i say i i don't believe a lot of the apologies i read online yes, yeah, <laughs> because yeah, because human we've developed a, a customer services style of apology which is to say i'm sorry if this has not met your if the, i'm sorry if this service has not met your expectation mm. and the the online version of that is uh, I'm sorry if this has caused offence. You have to teach people from a very early age that, that the I'm sorry cannot be followed by if. Right, 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 right. It doesn't. Yeah. It, it's not because that transfers the apology to the person being apologised to. Yes. You, basically, you, you're so stupid that, that I have to apologise to you for doing something I didn't think was wrong. Also, as children, soon as if comes in, it's not an apology. Children it has to be, I'm also, sorry that I did this, and no other sort of apology is, is valid. Children can also pick up very quickly that they can use words like magic words, like please and sorry. They might not, not only do they not mean it, but they perhaps don't even understand it, but they've learnt, uh, like, like Pavlov's dog, that by doing it means that they end the row and they, they can move on. So I'm, I mean, some people compared the behaviour of Matt Hancock and John Profumo, and I, I think it's interesting, and, and says something about the change in societal attitudes that... Uh, Matt Hancock said sorry, but then thought he could get straight back on the horse again. And that was possibly because I infer he wasn't really sorry. Profumo uh, attempted to brazen it out, by the way, attempted to lie his way through it, was caught out, was mortified, resigned from public life and dedicated himself to charity for the rest of his life. I, I, that's a more, I, I'm not saying he's the ideal Christian. As if, as if such a thing existed beyond Christ and perhaps the, the saints. But uh, he, that is an example of someone who has failed and then tried to do the right thing. Mm. As opposed to too many people nowadays, I think, who just continue brazing it out until they die, <laughs> who seem to feel, I've said sorry. So I've said sorry. So what, if you won't forgive me, then screw you. I'm going to get back on to what I was doing before. Do you think, Tim, though, maybe the problem is that we expect Matt Hancock to apologize to the public when he doesn't feel like he needs to or, or should do, but then the one person he should be asking forgiveness for is, say, his wife, for example, in that scenario. And, that's and so part, we're asking yeah. people to be insincere, in a sense. Which is part of the problem with all forms of public apology and disgrace, is that very often you are, you're, you're making public something which is intensely private, and we can't judge the degree to which he really is sorry or has been forgiven. Anyway, the morality of public figures is a very small part of this. Mm. It's, it's the way individuals who are not famous mm. and not prominent behave towards each other mm. in minute particulars, which is, which is the real thing. I, I, who would take their example of life from a, from a cabinet minister anyway? I mean, <laughs> yes. certainly, certainly not I. But it, it is, it, it's, in the, it's in the very, very small things, as William Blake says, good is done in minute particulars, not in generalities. And it, it, these habits of mind which, and, and habits of action, which were absolutely uh, built into the lives of our, for, of our forebears for centuries, have disappeared with amazing speed. And the knowledge of what the Bible says, for instance, which my, my father's generation had in some detail and could quote in, in large quantities without difficulty. The, the particular parts of English literature and poetry, which I think used to be very influential on behavior, they've disappeared from people's minds. There isn't anything there. They're wandering in a complete fog of unknowing, not really knowing what's right or what's wrong. Mm. So finishes off, I suppose. Um, it is Easter weekend. Do you have any hope for forgiveness, either of you, 
maybe ten first and then be set. Of course, uh, of course, I have because I, I believe in it. As I said, uh, when I became a Christian uh, initially, like a lot of people, I thought it was just saturated in guilt. Uh, and I, I, I've discovered over fifteen or so years how horribly wrong I was. The more I've grown into and understood my faith, it is a machine for the dispensing of forgiveness, uh, and that's a that's a wonderful thing. And how about you, Peter? Well, I'm always reminded by such questions of the man who was approached in the street by one of those people who rush up to you and say, are you saved? Are you saved? And he's, he mumbles a bit. And I said, are you saved? He says, well, I'm, I'm, perhaps I think I, I might be. And I said, well, why aren't you doing as I am? And rushing along the street, calling out, I am saved. He said, well, it was such a narrow squeak that I thought it would probably be wise to be quiet about it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Bev. Next, Donald Trump had to pay a $175 million bond this week after he was given a last-minute reprieve from a larger $500 million bond. Our deputy editor, Freddie Gray, is on the show now to talk all about it. Freddie, thank you for coming on Spectator TV. Great pleasure, John. Um, Trump had a bit of a legal win this week um, over a wrangle about a bond that he had to pay. Can you tell us a bit about it and, and what's happened there? Well, the Trump uh, law fair goes on and on and on and on and on, and it's impossible even for people that are paid to look keep up with it, to keep up with it. Um, so the general American public is understandably a bit confused. Um, this week was supposed to be the week that Trump was going to be forced to pay this bond. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of it hyped up, interestingly, by the Trump campaign itself, that he was going to have to sell Trump Tower. Um, the Trump campaign were pumping out these emails saying, uh, they're coming for Trump Tower, get your filthy hands off Trump Tower and so on. Um, anyway, on uh, Monday, it turned out uh, he didn't have to sell Trump Tower. Uh, he, rather than paying a $500 million bond, uh, that's been reduced to about 175, and it's thought that he can cover that. And that is in the civic New York trial uh, brought by Letitia James, um, which is about whether the Trump company inflated its assets to get more favorable loans from banks. Um, so it's not a criminal case. There was some slightly less good news for the Trump uh, family this week because the hush money case, uh, Trump himself's hush money case, uh, uh, which is, again is a slightly complicated tax case to do with hush money payments, um, there's going to, and that's a criminal case, not a civil one, that is going to begin on April the 15th. And that is probably the only trial that we will have some sort of resolution, or we're likely to have some sort of resolution over before the election. So that's why it's quite significant. And I think it's significant because even though legally it's a bit of a dodgy, Alvin Bragg, the, um, has, the prosecutor, has, has sort of merged various things together. And it's a bit of a dodgy legal thing, according to all the lawyers who, who analyze this, or seemingly fair-minded lawyers who analyze this. Um, but m in terms of the election, it might damage Trump a little bit because it does remind people that Trump had this dodgy playboy past with um, relationships, certainly with porn stars and so on. Um, so it, it, that, that's going to be the most relevant one as far as the election is concerned. Mm. How much of this sort of lawfare against Trump do you think is politically motivated? A lot of it. A lot of it. I mean, I think you'd have to be mad not to see that. A lot of the people going after Trump have been elected uh, on the pledge that they would go after Trump. Um, a lot of people are involved in it are clearly, as people have done since 2016, they get a lot of airtime, they get a lot of raise their profile by going after Trump. Um, the, there is still the resistance media, which is you know, the anti-Trump media, which is a large part of the American media landscape. Um, they will obsess over these stories. As long as it hurts Trump, it'll be headline news, um, regardless of whether it's you know, fair or well-motivated or whatever. I mean, how much do you think this is hurting Trump? I mean, maybe on the, the financial aspect, obviously he's had a bit of a win here, but he still has to pay 175 million in the next sort of 10 days or so. Um, is this all affecting his campaign and, and how much of his campaign is sort of self-funded and is it going to have an impact? Uh, I think it's obviously a nuisance and a headache, but it's one that his campaign is, is leaning into. Mm. Um, they are making, they have realised clearly that the more the legal trouble story is in the news, the better it is for, for him in the polls. This has just been proven to be true, mm. particularly over the last year. Um, and so... As far as the campaign goes, they, they'll talk about it as much as possible. But there's no doubt it's a nuisance. And we just don't know what will happen once you get into a criminal trial, which we're about to see, and whether the public will still feel the same way. Um, it seems like the Trump campaign are betting on the fact that 
uh, the legal troubles will send him, um, as I put it in a piece this week, will send him back to the White House, not mm. not the jailhouse. Mm. And I think you mentioned when you wrote about this, the, uh, the sort of the infamous Trump mugshot only seemed to sort of boost his popularity. Do you think a similar kind of thing could happen here with the criminal trial? I mean, having a sort of president-elect on the, on the dock. I think it's quite right, yeah, quite likely to, yes. I think what might happen, oddly, is actually when he gets away with it, when he gets off, Mm. Uh, that's when people might start to be a bit more, well, hang on, wasn't that all a bit dodgy? At the moment, because it's so obviously partisan and political, uh, it feels like the deep state is against him, as he says. Um, But when it turns out that the deep state can't sink him, if indeed it can't, um, then people might start going, oh, well, actually, hang on, that was all quite grubby. So it could be that the lawfare does harm him in the end. Mm. I suppose the other flip side of that would be if he does go down, he might become more popular, but sort of also be in prison. Is that a possibility, do you think? It is a possibility. And of course, he could run from prison. He could be elected in prison. Um, that's all feasible. He could pardon himself. Um, yeah, I, I don't put anything past Donald Trump. I think anybody who's tried to has been proven wrong. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Freddie. Pleasure. Who knew going electric requires electricity? Lana Shriver writes about this seemingly obvious fact in her column this week, off the back of reports in America suggesting that the move to green energy is pushing demand for electricity to new highs. Lionel joins me now. Lionel, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you write in the magazine this week about a revelation that has occurred to the New York Times. Uh, can you tell us tell us what that was? <laughs> that electric cars need electricity. Um, <laughs> is this news to them? I this was a you know their lead story uh, a, a few days ago and. It, it it began very dramatically about how, you know, something is, something strange is happening in the United States, you know, um, after, after uh, usage had been flat for many years, uh, suddenly we're using more electricity. And it, it's, it's a big surprise. And I, I, um, <laughs> I did honestly find it funny. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the bigger picture is, is of course, not funny in that um, we have politicians passing legally binding requirements of, you know, selling electric cars um, and and wanting us to go all electric on everything. It's not just the cars, uh, but, uh, you know, they want to get rid of gas cookers in the United States. They want to... Um, and and in, and both the UK and the US want us to go to heat pumps, and heat pumps use a lot of electricity. And yet, no one seems to have asked the question as to whether or not we have the capacity to generate that electricity. And that's so primitive that you really feel you are in the grip of people who are uh, not to put too fine a point on it, utter morons. <laughs> and um, I. That's the first thing you should do. And furthermore, you don't push people to get electric cars and electric everything and put in all these heat pumps before you get the grid capacity. You know, it's the ultimate cart before horse situation. Yeah. So, but I mean, this is rank incompetence and, and on, and, and at scale, at national scale. And I'm afraid it's it's both the United States and the UK. And I would, though I don't know the figures elsewhere, I wouldn't be surprised if this is Western wide. That uh, this is an ideological project. Um, it's a religious project, and therefore nobody wants to bother themselves with the untidy little practicalities. And and you know it's not it, it's not just the the gr- the grid, and but. There are, there are sub problems. For example, if you want to use green energy, particularly if you, you have to connect those solar and wind farms to the grid. And it's not just a matter of running an extension cord, right? You have to build these huge, um, high capacity, uh, power lines. Most of them are above ground. It's an enormous undertaking. It requires a lot of material, including these enormous transformers, which the U.S. does not have the capacity to produce at scale. 
And uh, it also requires a lot of legal permissions. And in the United States, especially, it means often crossing state lines, and that's a bureaucratic nightmare. The, and the ultimate um, joke on the whole project is that uh, certainly in the U.S., they're busy building gas fire p- power plants all over to cover the cost of powering green energy. I mean, all of these green, all this, all this electricity stuff that we're supposed to use instead of evil fossil fuels is going to be powered by fossil fuels. It makes the entire project a joke. And there's, I mean, there's even a, there's even a, um, a, a, a utility in Kansas that is keeping a coal-fired power plant online that they had been going to retire in order, specifically, in order to power a giant EV battery factory. Hmm. It's, it's kind of remarkable that sort of the, the res- resurrection of fossil fuels because of the green agenda. I mean, something that's that we've had in the UK as well is the intermittency problem that you mentioned, you know, the in the basic way, what do you do when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? I mean, have you got any sense that the US has sort of prepared for that in any way, or have they just kind of <laughs> stumbled blindly into where they are now? Not in the least. And, and uh, you know, I, I'm i sure we're all really tired. That same expression, I get so tired of it, you know, when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. We've, we've all read it over and over and over again. So you would think that they would have sorted it because... Some of these people are reading the same articles we are, but no, and there, there is no alternative right now to building what is ultimately a, a redundant system so that you actually have two energy systems. Does that sound cheap to you, right? That it, so there's a, you have to have a backup. And furthermore, firing up gas-fired power stations only when the, uh, the the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine um, is expensive because it, it, it's it's like anything you know it's 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 easier to keep it running all the time so I mean I just I just think that we're in the midst of a fiasco and 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 at fantastic scale and the all of all of these net zero laws have been rushed in the um, the uh, aims are, are the deadlines are unfeasible, and I, I, I just think we have to have a complete rethink. Now I can see that it would it, we're going to have to in the U.S. especially we're going to have to increase uh, electrical capacity partly because Biden is bringing in successfully bringing in more uh, manufacturing in the United States, but that takes power. Um, Lana, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that they're the sort of the driver of this, because in the UK, we've obviously had a lot of drama about net zero, um, but it's maybe passed a lot of people by that, that Biden has kind of made a similar pledge to have clean energy by 2035. Do you think that's the main driver of, of what's going on here and, and why it's causing problems? Well, as I said, this is a political project and it's been, it, it has been engineered by people who are not engineers. OK, they they don't know what they're doing. They they don't know what they they don't know the technical specs of what they want. And the the whole thing has been brought in with the bizarre and blase assumption that if we don't have the, the technology now, we'll have it later. And that's more cart before horse. I mean, that's just not the way innovation works. Uh, you, you don't you don't require innovation that you don't have yet. You can inspire it, you know, you can make, you can, it like, great, if you, it would be good if you could solve that problem, but you do not make public policy around technology that does not exist. And battery technology, for example, is completely, you know, well, it's untenable in its current form. It requires way too many um, rare earths. Uh, way too much copper. Uh, it's not doable, and and it's not scalable, and it's way too expensive. It it just it doesn't work. And so to say, oh well, battery technology is improving, and it it will be really great in five years. Well, that's just that's like praying. 
I think it's not like <laughs> science. I think you mentioned in the piece as well, Lionel, that the Biden administration hasn't been particularly helpful either towards nuclear power, which could maybe solve some of those intermittency problems. Do you mind telling us a bit about that? Well, the United States also, you know, as the UK does, has a, a, a problem with a popular hostility to nuclear. But if you're going to if you're going to go for a clean energy future, that's cl- clearly the only practical thing to do. And that is a technology that we do have. And and it, it doesn't use fossil fuels and it doesn't it doesn't have carbon emissions. So uh, but the, the problem is that the uh, the regulation uh, behind uh, nuclear power plants is fantastically burdensome. And it's it's getting through the regulatory process th- that makes building a nuclear power plant in the United States cost, it takes like 20 to 25 years. So you really have to think uh, ahead. And I, I do find it comical that it's, it's really the same political people, almost always the Democrats, who have passed all this regulation and now they're getting in their own way, right? They're tripping over their own regulations and they can't achieve their own goals of Biden wants to have completely carbon-free electricity by 2035, which is like tomorrow. Uh, so, so that would be that would be wind, solar, and nuclear. But we don't have time. You know, we don't have time. Uh, you know, the, you're not going to have any nuclear power plants, even if you start right now by 2035. So, you know, it's. It's it's a it's a it's a kind of variation on of being hoisted on your own petard. It's it's hoisted on your own terrible, complicated, time consuming regulations. <laughs> Seems very pie in the sky at the moment. Um, you mentioned as well that you know there's other Biden regulations or legislation that's making things worse in terms of electricity and the grid, which is the Inflation Reduction Act. Can you sort of uh, tell us a bit more about that? Um, well, I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, which of course does nothing but increase inflation because it's, all, it's, it's about spending trillions of dollars that the United States doesn't actually have. Um, it, it, it includes a lot of uh, green energy uh, pork, all right? And, and therefore, it, you know, there's a certain amount of money for building... Um, uh, chargers for for EVs. Although I I think I read today that it's only enough for something like four thousand. And if you know anything about the extent of the U.S., that's just ridiculous. Uh, is that charging um, point? Sorry, Lionel. Char- the charging things, you know, that you you plug it in on the street, uh, but that's that's not nearly good enough uh, for covering the whole country. Um, and, and, you know, there are these targets uh, to um, have half of uh, the cars on the road EVs by 2035, and that right now it's 8%. That's not achievable, and that's fortunate it's not achievable because every, if everyone plugged in their 50% of the cars in the United States, the, place, the, the entire country would explode. I mean, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal today that uh, on average, when you plug in an EV in, in an American household, you double the amount of usage immediately. And if you were to have two electric cars and plug them in, you triple your usage immediately. And is this piece observed? Um, if all of your neighbors do the same thing, the transformer at the end of the street explodes. So I'm not, I, I say the place would explode. I'm, I'm not being metaphorical. Right. Oh, thank you very much, Lana. It's uh, good to know there's a country with uh, just as bad an energy policy as the UK. <laughs> oh, yes, we're, we're both in the same leaky boat. <laughs> thank you very much. Svetlana Moronets writes in this week's magazine about Ukraine's drive to freeze the sperm of its soldiers. Discuss, Svetlana joins me now. Svetlana, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you write in the magazine this week, um, it's a fascinating piece about 
the birth rate in Ukraine and how people are dealing with it there. But so to start us off, can you tell us a bit about the birth rate? You mentioned it's going down, down but it's quite a dramatic level. Is that right? Yes, at the moment, Ukraine has the lowest birth rate in the world. And also, we not only have uh, little kids being born, but also we have a lot of people dying because of the war. Mm. At least 31,000 Ukrainian soldiers were killed. We have uh, 10,000 civilians killed by Russian attacks. Also, 6 million refugees abroad, and 1 million of them are children. And also, Russia deported 20,000 Ukrainian children because they have own birth rate crisis so they decided to take our children to help it so for ukraine it's quite a big problem that's why ukrainian clinics offered to freeze uh, sperm and eggs of ukrainian soldiers for free uh, as soon as russia invaded two years ago and only two years after the government decided to step in and they're going to cover the storage costs. But we don't know yet when the program is, will start because Ukraine has a huge budget deficit. Hmm. And why is it that Ukrainian soldiers in particular are, are freezing their sperm? And tell us a bit about what they're sort of thinking there. Uh, because uh, first, when they go to the front line, when they don't know uh, when they will return because uh, we have little rotations right now. We don't have enough people in the army, so soldiers are staying for two years there. And if they do return, it's mostly because they were maimed in, in some way. Mm. So it's uh, from one side, it's like a precaution. And uh, some families, uh, like uh, I know one story when a soldier's Soldier went to the front line, but before he froze his sperm and his wife used it for IVF. So while he was away, she got right. pregnant, but unfortunately he died. And she, when the children were born, he was already dead. So she's going to be a single mother. Yeah. And you mentioned as well that soldiers are sort of doing this on purpose as well. They have something called a biological will. So they're saying that in the events of their death, their, their sperm can still be used to, to create a baby. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's what uh, the law right now requires them to do, is to write a will uh, naming a woman who will have permission to use their sperm in case of their death. Mm. I mean, you mentioned that in some countries this kind of thing is banned, you know, letting posthumous IVF. Mm -hmm. uh, in other countries, they make people wait like a year before before women can, can use the sperm to have a baby. I mean. What's, what's the reception to this been like in Ukraine? What do, what do Ukrainians think of this? Uh, there is no ethical debate about that. Anyway, it's up to the soldiers and their partners uh, to decide whether they want to do it or not. Mm. Of course, I think uh, women should be aware that uh, to raise a child alone is very difficult and expensive, especially during the war. Mm. And it's also quite... Um, emotionally difficult because uh, she will be mourning the death of her uh, beloved one mm -hmm. and at the same time taking care of a child. So I think it's very difficult. But um, why this topic started to be so popular? Because the government wanted uh, to uh, destroy a soldier's mm -hmm. sperm in case of their death. So I, the the reason was because uh, storage costs, then they wouldn't need to, co to cover those costs. And because Ukraine is like a lot of money that it would be so expensive to do that. So they said, OK, we are going to cover the uh, storage costs while the soldier is alive. But when he dies, we're going to destroy it. And there was a huge backlash from the soldiers, families and also medical professionals. And they had to change it. And right now they're going to cover uh, the storage costs for three years after a soldier's death. And then, um, or it will be destroyed, or the um, person who was written in soldier's will can decide that she's going to continue paying for the storage, or she's mm. going to use it. And you mentioned that the government isn't covering all the costs for things like IDF and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Is there some pressure on them to do so, do you think? Um, everybody understands that Ukraine doesn't have money right now for that. They cover like little am amount of IVF, but it costs in Ukraine from 2,000 pounds. I know in Britain it is much more expensive, but <laughs> you have to take into account that the average monthly salary in Ukraine is 300 pounds. So it's very expensive for uh, Ukrainians. And uh, private clinics, clinics have been covering all of the expenses for IVF too, but they say as uh, the procedure became more popular and demand surged, for example, now up to 20 soldiers go to every month to a clinic asking for 
uh, these procedures. So they say that runny tend to run out even in private clinics. And I know that one uh, that started doing this process for free, uh, they found an American patron who mm-hmm. helped to cover half of the cost. So clinics trying to find uh, patrons abroad and to see who is willing to sponsor this program. Mm. Do you think they'll be successful in finding international donors for this kind of thing? Mm, I think if they already started and some people agree, then yes, because, uh, for example, it's not like, I think we would, we won't ask the governments of other countries to cover that because I know that around the world, everybody has a crisis with birth rates mm. <laughs> and we need like, uh, we need the governments to help us with weapons and that stuff. But for example, some rich people who maybe think they want to do something nice, that they, they, they can do it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sadar. And finally, Damien Thompson joins the show to tell us about his friend, Stephen O'Leary. Damien, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV. Um, you write a lovely piece in the magazine this week in your life column about your friend, Stephen O'Leary. Um, so can you start us off, can you tell us a bit about him and, and who he was? Stephen O'Leary was the cleverest man I've ever met. He was a bouncy, incredibly talkative, hyperactive, insatiably intellectually curious American professor. He was a professor of communications at the Annabelle School for Communication at the University of Southern California, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it was a nice, well-remembered job. And I got to know him because I was writing a book about belief in the end of the world. And Stephen had written an impenetrable, pretty impenetrable, but beautifully argued book called Arguing the Apocalypse which has studied millennial rhetoric and it's a study of how rhetorically people who believe in the end of the world make their claims. And there's much reference to Aristotle and stuff that was way above my head, to be honest. So I pretended that I understood it, but meeting him was quite an experience because you don't expect a professor to be somebody you hang out with and do sort of schoolboy naughty things (laughs) as well as learning these fabulously interesting things that you should have learned in school and and I don't know the cleverest person I ever knew in my life no doubt about it Mm -hmm. you mentioned this you started off you wanted to interview him and then how did that sort of develop into a to a friendship it developed into a friendship because nothing Stephen did was conventional he kept me waiting for nearly two hours in the Bodhi tree the new age bookstore in West Hollywood I do apologize for my voice, by the way. I don't normally sound this ancient, but (laughs) writing this article has made me think about mortality. Oh, sorry, sorry. (laughs) We're in the Bodhi tree, which is where all the hipsters, though we didn't call them hipsters then, where all the hippies read Shirley MacLaine's latest ravings. Right. And he kept me waiting two hours, which I then learned was classic Stephen. I mean, (laughs) two, uh, two hours was, I was lucky. He turns up gabbling with beard and sandals and, and, and you know, shorts, and I thought, oh, we're not going to get on, and he, he's gabbling so fast I could hardly follow what he was saying. And the end of it, he says, you seem like a good fellow. Um, I'm going up to see my wife's parents in the north of the soap. Will you house it for me for a few days? And I thought, I've just arrived. He's only just met me. <laughs> but I house that in his, the house he had with his then wife in L.A. And um, we traveled around Southern California meeting millennial prophets, meeting people who are predicting the end of the world. So we went to fundamentalist churches, we had New Age bookstores and heard the the dippy theories about earth changes and um, earthquake weapons and all sorts of crazy apocalyptic scenarios. Mm. And we picked up endless books and everything Stephen did, however recondite he was able to relate to popular culture, shows he'd watched, music he'd listened to. We both love music, slightly different tastes, but I learned so much from him. I mean, he introduced me to a lot of jazz and folk music I didn't know about, but he also knew a tremendous amount about English polyphonic music. We both loved the music of Bruckner and, and Beethoven, and we stayed up late at night. I had recently given up drinking, and I haven't started again, but so I'm nearly 30 years, but um, I remember Stephen offering me a joint, and I said no, because I'd just given up drinking. But that was my first indication that actually he was quite laid back about stuff like that. And 
later I didn't always say no. And we had a lot of slightly crazy fun. But I suppose the underlying reality is that we were both addicts. I, I don't drink. But I have had a problem written about it at length, actually, about we were prescription drugs that make you high, that feel great. And Stephen had a problem with drugs two and we didn't necessarily do this stuff together but there was one extraordinary trip south of the border to a town I think it's called Rosario Beach I think it's where Meghan Markle's father lives actually <laughs> which at the time was you know every other it, basically every storefront was a pharmacy mm. and you didn't really need prescriptions and he was looking for Ritalin because he needed to finish writing an essay which he never did and I was taking something else, some nice benzodiazepine, which goes quite well with California sunset. And then I went back to his house. He'd separated from his wife by this stage, and I ate his Ritalin because I had to index a book that I was, I'd written for Oxford University Press, and they've got Nazi-like indexes, and so I had to do this. I ate all his Ritalin. He was furious. <laughs> but, you know... He, he was going to send me some Adderall, which is a concentration drug, right. which connoisseurs will say is even nicer than Ritalin. They give this stuff to school kids. It's totally crazy. Mm. And he was supposed to stitch it into a book, the spine of a book, and send it to me. And he explained in great detail, and he showed me the book and how he was going to do it and everything. I thought, oh, I have some nice Adderall to help me write the next chapter or whatever. And then he ate the whole lot himself. I think it could have been revenge for me <laughs> eating the Ritalin. But. So it was a strange relationship, but it was yeah. very intense. Mm. It was funny. We had terrible rows. Um, it was stimulating. And there was a love, really, there. You know, a platonic love, mm. which Stephen, being an American, quite unguarded about these things, mm. not reticent, would kind of express, I love you, man, I, you know, I love you, I will look out for you. And, and he did that even after he was diagnosed with cancer and had very little time left. Mm. I was going to say, um, you know, it's often difficult for men, especially, I mean, that's probably maybe beyond childhood and so on, to make friends, to have fond male friendships. Do you think part of the reason it was easier with, with him is because he was sort of that American spirit or that openness? And Yes, I think so. I really, th and I, I think the, the, diff the cultural differences between us, I mean, he was left-wing, I was right-wing, sort of. In practice, we agreed on most things. Um, he came from California, I came from Kent. Um, and then Reading. I try not to think about that. Um, I think the differences made for a really interesting friendship and people who knew both of us said they didn't quite understand the bond it was like a sort of mysterious and you're right these friendships I mean I was, I was still pretty young at the time and so was he to be honest um, not young by your standards maybe but <laughs> mid-30s yeah. and I, the thing I think about friendships is yes it's much it's a very different business when you're young that sort of careless rapture of youth Friendships are really bound up with your optimism, the joy of discovery, mm. um, the huge empty horizons of your future. And as you get older, meeting new people is, there's less time to share with them and you're more preoccupied by your own problems, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, but with Steve and I was lucky. I, we caught, caught each other at a, at a time when things were going really well for us. And the bomb was strong enough so that when things were not going so well for us, we were still able to stay very good friends. Mm. And you mentioned his drug use, and obviously that was part of your relationship, but when did you sort of get the sense that it was taking a sort of larger toll in terms of an addiction? Well, if I were to tell the story, I think that would be intrusive yeah, for, for his ex-wife and his children. It's a really sad story. Um. Um, but I, the details are, the details are very distressing, and so, but he, he did go into rehab, and it, it finally worked, mm. and he was back at the beginning of 2020. He was back doing something called shape note singing, 
which is a great enthusiasm. It's, typical. It's, it's, it's a type of American hy folk hymn singing dating from the 19th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, where you sing, people would sit in a square and sort of holler a certain sort of hymn at each other. The closest equivalent would be the psalms that they sing on the islands of Scotland, which, oh, okay. yeah. in which nobody's voice is trained, but somehow it creates a very joyful noise. Well, the, Stephen was heavily into shape note singing. Mm. And that's how he met his wife, actually. And um, he was back doing that. But I did, during the time that things were going wrong for him, he didn't look after himself. And I remember saying, Stephen, you know, you're not going to hit 60 unless you stop this mm. or look after yourself. Mm. And he did hit 60, but mm -hmm. not for long. I thought actually one of the most moving things in your piece, Damien, was the, was the sort of point that even after he was diagnosed with cancer, he was very much concerned with your welfare. Yes, he was. I mean, at the, at the time my sister was, had been diagnosed with terminal cancer and that was very difficult. And this letter appeared, which I say it's a platonic love letter. It's much longer than the little extract in the article. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful piece of prose written by a man who you wouldn't think was capable of such eloquence because he'd been so damaged and battered and such optimism as well. And he basically said, do exercise, get out of bed, even if you don't feel like it. And it's all very elegantly and lovingly expressed. And I will be there for you. And we will, the, 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 you know, the world in which we listened to music together and did stuff together, you know, I cannot believe that that has ended. Even if I have to come under, over to London, health permitting, I will kick you out of bed and we will go to concerts together. And, and I just had to remind myself that a few days earlier, he told me that his cancer was really bad. Um. And then a mutual friend, a few days later, it was, it was the it was the twenty fifth of January, um, the day after my birthday, and I just got an email saying, uh, Stephen, R.I.P. It happened, it finally happened, and I knew what that meant. And so he had actually died on my birthday. And for somebody, the reason I saw him was because he's a great expert on calendars. And he loved the complications and the coincidences and everything. And the, the fact that this world's expert on apocalyptic calendars managed to die on my birthday, I felt was something that would have amused him or intrigued him because he, was, he had an unbounded imagination. Um, well, thank you for telling us about your friend, Damon, and, and I could encourage everyone to read your piece. Thanks a lot. That's it for this week. Once again, if you enjoy Spectator TV, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for watching and do join us again next week.